Αγαπητοί τηλεθεατές, καλησπέρα σας. Η εκπομπή Ομογένεια Δολονδίνα, όπως κάθε Παρασκευή, συνεπεί στο ραντεβού της, είναι και απόψε κοντά σας για να σας παρουσιάσει τις εκδηλώσεις και τα δρόμενα που διαδραματίζονται στην Ομογένεια. Η ομάδα παραγωγής σας υπόσχεται την έγκυρη εβδομαδιαία ενημέρωσή σας. Για τους τηλεθεατές μας από το Ηνωμένο Βασίλειο, να σας ενημερώσουμε ότι μπορείτε να παρακολουθείτε το πρόγραμμά μας, αλλά και τις υπόλοιπε παραγωγές του Hellenic TV από το Rockbox, που μπορείτε να το προμηθευτείτε από τα γραφεία της ETA UK στο Southgate. Με αυτόν τον τρόπο μπορείτε να βλέπετε το Hellenic TV One και ολόκληρη την πλατφόρμα του που περιλαμβάνει 14 ελληνικά κανάλια από Ελλάδα και Κύπρο, νέες κινηματογραφικές παραγωγές, καθώς και να υποφεληθείτε από όλες τις υπόλοιπες υπηρεσίες που προσφέρει η CETA UK. Περισσότερες πληροφορίες σχετικά με τα προγράμματα του Hellenic TV μπορείτε να βρείτε στην ιστοσελίδα μας www.hellenictv.net ενώ για τον τρόπο με τον οποίο μπορείτε να παρακολουθείτε ολόκληρη την πλατφόρμα του Hellenic TV στις τηλεοράσεις σας στην ιστοσελίδα www.citauk.com Για την προβολή των εκδηλώσεών σας και της επιχείρησής σας επικοινωνήστε μαζί μας στο τηλέφωνο 020-8292-7037 ή στην ηλεκτρονική μας διεύθυνση info at hellenictv.net Στο απόψινό μα πρόγραμμα θα σα παρουσιάσουμε την εκδήλωση που διοργανώθηκε στη Βουλή των Κοινοτήτων για την ενημέρωση στο θέμα τη μόρφου, το χριστουγεννιάτικο παζαράκι που διοργάνωσε ο Σύνδεσμο Κυπρίων Γυναικών Αγγλίας, μικρό απόσπασμα από την ομιλία του μέλου τη Κεντρική Επιτροπή του ΑΚΕΛ κ. Γιαννάκη Κολοκασίδη και σύντομη συνέντευξή του, και τέλο αποσπάσματα από τη συναυλία στην Εκκλησία του Τιμίου Σταυρού στο κουαρτέτο του Τζορτζ Ζαχαρία. Ας ξεκινήσουμε με το πρώτο μας θέμα που έχει να κάνει με την εκδήλωση που διοργανώθηκε στη Βουλή των Κοινοτήτων για την ενημέρωση στο θέμα της μόρφου. Αντιπροσωπεία του Δήμου Μόρφου με επικεφαλή τον Δήμαρχο Μόρφου κ. Χαράλα Μποπίτα βρέθηκε στο Λονδίνο από την Τετάρτη 26 Νοεμβρίου μέχρι το Σάββατο 29 Νοεμβρίου για μια σειρά συναντήσεων με Βρετανούς βολευτές καθώς επίσης και τον Δήμαρχο και με μέλη του Δημοτικού Συμβουλίου του Δήμου Πάνετ Λονδίνου ο οποίος είναι αδερφοποιημένος με το Δήμο Μόρφου. Την Τετάρτη 26 Νοεμβρίου έγινε η συνάντηση σε αίθουσα του Βρετανικού Κοινοβουλίου υπό την αιγίδα ομάδας Βρετανών βουλευτών μετά από πρωτοβουλία του βουλευτή Σερ Άλαν Μιλ. Εμείς πρώτα θα παρακολουθήσουμε το καλωσόρισμα από τον Σερ Άλαν Μιλ και την ομιλία του Δημάρχου Μόρφου κ. Χαράλα Μπουπίτα στο House of Commons στο Jubilee Room. Ας παρακολουθήσουμε. Uh, Consular General from the Greek Embassy for, for coming here. We are very, very grateful for that. Uh, and, and also the President of the Morpho Association. But more important, we have a, a character here who started off life uh, as, a, as a mainstay priest in the United Kingdom when he was in Mansfield, my own constituency, many years ago. And Father Damien has is, is come down from North London to share, share in tonight's uh, events. And we're very, very grateful and indeed for that. Uh, There's another person who I wanted to mention in the course of uh, my introduction is that we have a hero's hero here tonight. We have lots of them actually, but we've got one in particular who's known to uh, members of parliament because he actually was one. And there's no other member of parliament either before or since the uh, independence movement uh, arrived in the 60s concerning Cyprus who's fought more and longer and harder than Tom Cox, so we're very grateful for him to move to work. Uh, finally, just to say that we're also very, very grateful for the people who've come from uh, Morfu to share with us what's going on uh, in that part of the world at the present time, which has got to be difficult. And in particular, Bambos, the, the mayor, and other members of the council were here and known to us in, in this place for the various activities they do on behalf of not only Morfu, but also Cyprus and the Mediterranean area in general. And we're extremely grateful for their persistence on their search for uh, maintenance, uh, well, appearance and maintenance of democracy in that part of the world. And we're forever grateful that they fight in the front line, the good fight, which eventually will win the day and Cyprus will be free and will be a united country and will play a full and decent part in the European experience. So without further ado, I'll come back and say a few words later, but I'd like to first of all introduce Bambos, the, uh, the mayor of uh, Morfu, uh, Kumbari Morfidis, uh, uh, as he is described, and uh, uh, he'll say a few words here, Bambos. Honourable members, from the British Parliament, dear Alan, me, 
dear representative of the Greek Embassy in the United Kingdom, dear President of Henos Isabodimon, Peripherias Morfu, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to express our many thanks to Alan Mill and to the other members of the British Parliament for the support that they offered to us for so many years in our struggle for a just and viable solution to the Cyprus problem. <coughs> Morfu, our beloved hometown, and the large part of our, isle, of our island is under Turkey's occupation for 40 long years. The tragic summer of 1974 has left deep, painful marks in our lives. The Turkish invited and occupied our town. They killed, raped, and destroyed everything in their path, and we were forced to run for our lives, abandoned our homes and properties, and left everything behind <coughs> us. However, we are always carry in our hearts and mind our history. <clears throat> we have, we carry with us the memories and pictures of our beloved town, memories and pictures that will always hold until the day of our return to Morfu. For 40 years, we, the refugees of Morfu, are fighting and claiming our right for the return to our town. In this struggle, we met with friends and supporters for our cause. What occurred in Cyprus in the tragic summer of 1974 can only be described as ethnic cleansing, with 200,000 of people being displaced from their houses, deprived of their property, seeking refuge, refuge to the south part of the island. Our culture, treasure, and national heritage have been destroyed or illegally exported and sold abroad. Our churches have been destroyed, converted into, stable, into stables or hotels. Our homes are now occupied by the settlers from mainland Turkey in an attempt to change the demographic character of our, of our island. Today we are here in London to express our great disappointment and protest for the position taken by the British Prime Minister, Mr. David Cameron, and his government of Turkey's recent illegal actions and aggressiveness. As you all know, Turkey's research vessel has entered and has violated the Cyprus exclusive economic zone. The action is provocative, illegal, and violates all international and European maritime laws and undermines the security and stability not only in Cyprus, but also the stability in the greater region. Despite this provocative illegal violation, Mr. Cameron and the British government decided not to support the EU demands at the UN regarding Turkey's incursion into the Republic of Cyprus exclusive economic zone. We are greatly disappointed by this action of the British government. The Cypriot people expected the support and solidarity of the British government since Cyprus is an EU member state whose sovereignty and sovereign rights have been violated by the state that is candidate for EU membership. Turkey's occupation of Cyprus continues for 40 long years now, and unfortunately, Turkey still today works towards the division of our country and the recognition of two separate states. Under these circumstances, there cannot be a dialogue with Turkey at this moment.
and Turkey Cypriot, who urge the international community and the British government in particular not to be tolerant and so and, and to exercise their influence in terminating <coughs> Turkey's illegal actions that make it possible for the reunification negotiations to resume. The people of Cyprus Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots must live together in a state that all human rights and basic freedoms are respected and secured. Our children have the right and we have the obligation to offer our children a reunited and a prosperous Cyprus. Once again, we sincerely thank you, dear friends, members of the British Parliament. Στη συνέχεια ακολούθησαν και άλλες ομιλίες από τον βουλευτή Σερ Άλαν Μίλ και τον βουλευτή Σερ Ρότζερ Γκέιλ. Εμείς θα παρακολουθήσουμε αποσπάσματα από τις ομιλίες τους. Actually, we here in this building should be very, very proud of you because we learned the democratic process from your forefathers and we've developed it and some might say we've snaffled it up and turned it into something of our own. We call ourselves the mother of the parliaments, but we're not a democratic nation at all. We're still a constitutional monarchy, so we haven't learned everything yet. And, uh, and yet we still realize and talk about the importance of the democratic process and the institutions where ordinary democratic people can try and argue their case and cause. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, a time when we need to be paying tribute to you rather than you to us in that regard because the soldiers from Greece uh, and the Middle East are still there active in the democratic process and uh, until we get freedom in whatever country it is, particularly in the European area, then we're not a free and democratic uh, family at all. We're something somewhat different and it's very important for us to do that uh, because democracy is quite special. It's also very hard by the way. It's a very, very hard thing to achieve, but it's better than tyranny. It's certainly better than dictatorship. And it's the best idea so far we've got. There are all different forms of it, but it shows that uh, unless we're prepared to fight for it and work for it, it'll never apply. And it won't be very much use indeed, other than a term of endearment. So your being here today is very, very important indeed. Lots of people ask me about why I became involved in uh, the whole of the Cyprus issue. It was of course uh, another deceased member of parliament actually, a very, very close friend of Tom, Tom and I, Tony Benn. I worked as Tony's head of office for seven years before I was a member of parliament. And uh, when I came into parliament, I said to Tony, tell me one piece of advice. I've given you lots over the year. Most of it's got you in trouble, but I would like it if you'd get me into trouble equally now by giving me just one ordinary piece of advice to help me out in this new role that I've got. And he said, look round for one international issue. And when you find it, stick th with it through bad and good, because it'll make it a bigger person. And that's what's important. And I went round every single one of all the international groups in parliament. And uh, the, there were many in this place that people tend to get uh, different groups from all over the world and, uh, and uh, join them in friendship. And the last one I came to was, was uh, uh, the one on Cyprus. And I, I can remember vividly, even now, walking up to the top corridor in uh, the committee corridor upstairs and going along to, uh, to see uh, uh, what this meeting was about. And uh, there in the corridor were about 50 people. And another character was there. And he's sitting in the audience today, Carolis, uh, Mr. Snail. He's in the, uh, in the audience. And he said, come, we've got to go. And I said, well, wait till all the other politicians turn up. And I, actually, they didn't, because they're all away on different meetings and so on. So I was the only one there. We went in the meeting room. We had two hours on one of the best political meetings I've ever had in my life. And I actually didn't adopt Cyprus. Cyprus adopted me. And ever since then, I've been in trouble. And it's all about this one particular uh, cause. But I have stuck with it. And I've stuck with it not because it was just there and I went, went about it. I stuck with it because it was right. 
And the more I heard about it, the more I thought about it, it had all the elements of the democratic process and what we're supposed to stand up for. And I'll give you an instance. They talked about the missing, and I found it appalling that we had a huge amount of missing people, persons, relatives of British citizens and uh, you know, others that, that were friends of uh, Britain and had worked for the British Empire and Commonwealth before that. And they were left without any knowledge of their loved ones without, uh, in fact, being deliberately kept away from any of the, the knowledge and information of that, which is absolutely scandalous, and it's still a scandal today as it was then. But more important, we had, as I saw it, an obligation. We were a, a country under a Labour government that came into power and instantly said, we recognise that the, uh, the nature of... Uh, of, of Cyprus is such, it should be a free nation. And we agreed to it in independence and a, an act of parliament came through, the Cyprus Act. And within that, all the elements were there for it to play a full and decent part in the Commonwealth, yes, but as a free, independent nation. So we were part and parcel of that whole operation to give independence through. All right, we're engaged in a, in a fracas and a war in the process of that. Incidentally, where Cypriots were to, to, to say the least, quite advanced in, in the way they did it. He took on the largest, strongest army in the world and defeated it with about 200 children and uh, one or two other elderly people, which I think is quite amazing. And they got independence then through the struggle which applied. Now, so it had all the elements. It, it had our responsibility for allowing or enabling the democratic process to be evolved and independence to be there, to be attached to the Cyprus people. And yet we were letting them down as a sovereign power which stepped back and away on the whims of other politicians who had a direct interest in Cyprus themselves, whether it be for uh, defence purposes or they saw it as part of their own homeland. They had other things, and we had enabled independence to be occurred. And then we stepped back away from this sovereign partnership we created, a family, we stepped back and said we weren't going to live up to our responsibility. So a combination of the missing, a combination of lack of responsibility, a combination also of anger that somebody should have the nerve to just invade a sovereign country, illegal and occupied, fill it with troops and refuse to move and take people's property and land and don't even get them access to even look at it, but to expel them from their own country. It was outrageous. And people in those days were outraged about China, they were outraged about the Soviet Union, they were outraged about all kinds of things throughout the world. But here we had an instance where there, there was a sovereign-based nation in our family who were just <coughs> left alone. Why? Because they were small. I remember uh, Lisa Ridis once uh, said to me, Alan, if, if it was oil, not olive oil, everybody would be here. And he was nearly right. And he still might have the, the whole elements of it himself because that may come about. His prediction all those many decades ago might, might actually be correct. Because it was simply that the world recognised Cyprus as just simply a tiny island as far as they were concerned. And in the shape of things there was something over the water which had a much, much larger population and an access to a market which is all about capital that they preferred to be on the side of. And there's all the excuses in the world given that it was Kissinger playing games. The United States were of self-interest. They wanted a listening station. They wanted, a, uh, they wanted it to be like a static aircraft carrier. And they saw for the Middle East. And they saw Cyprus as probably a possible position where they could get a foothold in Europe or that southern part of Europe. Now, all of these things, what I'm telling this, it all came about out of self-interest, not about the democratic process itself. The democratic process which we all fought for and actually sought to deliver and maintain. That's why we gave independence. We didn't give it up just as somebody else could come in and take command of it. We gave it up because we thought it was the right thing to do and it was the right thing for them to play a full part in our, in our family. And so, you know, the whole of the aspects of why I got involved uh, was there. And then shortly what followed, but as Andreas always does, he... He badges you until such a time that you end up doing things you can't even remember when you agreed to them. But uh, I found myself and my wife on our own, paid for ourselves, out in Cyprus, landing in all places, Paphos, which is only a very tiny airport then. And I got off, we got off the bus, and we were, we were booked into a hotel in Limassol. 
And when we got on the bus, we ne neither of us be disciples, so anywhere like it in our lives like that before, we got on the bus and we left Paphos Airport and we went to Limassol, across the old road from Paphos. And it was like being on the moon. It was, it was desolate. It was the most inhospitable, crazy place that you ever said. And I thought, my God, we, you know, we, we don't, I didn't even know we were going to be able to get back. But what we had was three weeks of the best uh, introduction to a country we've ever had in our lives. The people were friendly, people were kind, despite what we have done, how a lack of responsibility to, to what occurred. We'd left them high and dry on their own and acceded to a foreign power who had no right to be there whatsoever. But we had a, an incredible relationship with the people there who were nothing else but friendly towards the British, which surprised me a little, little bit at that time. It's a huge pleasure to be able to welcome my mayor to the House of Commons and my town council, my district council. I regard it as an enormous honour to be a citizen of Morfu. Uh, I don't really know how to thank you. But it makes it very personal. <clears throat> and for me, this whole struggle has always been personal. It's never been about politics, really, or religion, or international power games, or all the other things that people play. It's been about people. When I first came into the House of Commons in 1983, a bloke called George Yerolamo, who some of you will have known, came to see me. I think he'd been here about three days. <clears throat> he took out his wallet and he took out a tatty photograph of a villa. And he said, you're my MP, I want you to get my home back. So, you know, fine, okay, you know, that's easy, we'll do that tomorrow and then the day after that we'll do something else. Well, that was 32 years ago. George's wife died. George died. And they didn't get their home back. So I feel a great sense of failure in that, set, in, in, in that regard. <clears throat> but George and I went north looked at his villa, somebody else digging a hole in his garden to put a swimming pool in. It wasn't much fun. But we went on from there up to Comic Kabir, which is where he was born and where he came from. And we visited George's family home, the place where he was born. And it was occupied by a fairly elderly Turkish Cypriot lady and we banged on the door and weren't quite sure what sort of reception we were going to get. And she knew, she recognized him immediately. Hadn't seen him for about 70 years. She was five when he left the village. But she invited us in. We had coffee, we sat down, we had a chat. I say we had a chat, they had a chat. A separate chat, it went on for several hours. <laughs> um, in a dialect that I don't think even the Turks or the Cypriots would have, or the Greeks would have understood. They were great friends. When George died, his son, his son and I, Nick and I went back and we said we'd like to put a plate on the wall. No problem. So we put, a, you know, George Yerolem who was born here, the dates of his life and death on the wall. And I thought, again, as I thought at the beginning, isn't that what communities are about? Is it not absolute madness that we have people who fundamentally, if they were left to get on, without politicians getting in the way, would get on? They enjoy each other's company and speak each other's languages as they always used to and each eat each other's food and drink each other's coffee and be friends. 
Now, I know that's a dewy-eyed view because I know there were problems between the two communities from time to time. But again, they were made, they were manufactured problems. They were problems caused by politicians. They weren't politicians caused by humans. We're not humans. Um, that's what it's always, for me, that's what it's always been about. So when, long time ago, I went up in the Trudos and looked down, it's the only way at that time you could do it, at the whole district of Morfu, and looked at those olive groves and compared them with the apple trees, the orchards of Kent. I thought, yeah, I understand this. I understand why you want to go home. <clears throat> it's not bricks and mortar. It's the fields, it's the trees, it's the olive groves, it's the oranges, it's your churches, sorry, our churches. It's the way that you need to be able to visit the burial places of your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents and your forebears. And I find this utterly inhumane. And that's why it gets to me. That's why so many... We don't have a huge Cypriot community in Margate. It's a very valuable community. I'll come on to that in a moment. But numbers don't matter. They don't matter to me, anyway. I don't care if it's one vote or ten votes or a hundred votes or three hundred votes or five hundred votes or five thousand votes. What matters is the principle. And the principle is that we have in Cyprus an occupied country. Now, that country is now a member of the European Union. That makes it even worse. It can't really be allowed, I think, to continue. Well, having broken the promise to George, not got his home back for him by the time that he went to the great kitchen in the sky, I broke another promise in October. This was a promise to myself. I promised myself that I'd never go to Morfu until I could go to a free Morfu. And over. Well, I'm sorry, but I, I, I did break the promise because I was told Andreas does everything in very quick order and gives you plenty of warning about everything. But I was told, sort of, about five minutes' notice that I was going to be made a citizen of Morfu. So I thought, you can't really be a citizen of somewhere you've never been to, visited, seen, whatever. So I better go. I asked Bambos, and Bambos said, yeah, it's OK, it's fine. Um, we understand. You go. I shan't go back, by the way, until it's free. But I went, and I went through the green line. And I, wouldn't, I didn't take my British passport. Where's Alan gone? Oh, he's gone to find the caterers. Uh, he's doing a really important job. Um, <laughs> I took my Council of Europe passport. Now, there's a funny little document, which is about half a millimetre thick, which you can actually, if you are a member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, you're supposed to be able to travel throughout Europe on. Well, I've tried it in a number of countries. I've actually come through Heathrow on it once. But I think the border guard was asleep. But I gave them my Council of Europe passport, which caused mayhem. Uh, and, a, and a degree of grief for, I have to say, the people whose car I was travelling in because it delayed them enormously, because this passport went backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And nobody could work out what it was. And anyway, finally, somebody fairly senior did come along and say, yeah, OK, fine, you can come in. I was prepared to make merry hell if, if they turned it down, but they didn't. Somebody got cute enough to let me in and perhaps quite significantly, let me out as well. Um, so I went in, and of course we had a look around, and of course some of my dearest friends from Morfu showed me their houses that other people were living in, some of whom 
whose occupants had treated them very well and tried to preserve family photographs and respect the property and the furniture and everything that was not theirs, and others who frankly couldn't give a damn. But either way, I wouldn't like anybody living in my house without my permission. And that's basically what it comes down to. And again, it's a human factor. It was a very humbling experience. Uh, we did drive past the cemetery. And I don't believe that desecration εδώ να σας αναφέρουμε ότι ο Δήμαρχος Μόρφου και οι Δημοτικοί Σύμβουλοι που τον συνόδευαν επέδωσαν ψήφισμα στον Βρετανό Πρωθυπουργό Ντέιβιτ Κάμερον στην Πρωθυπουργική Κατοικία στο 10 Downing Street. Επίσης είχαν συνάντηση στο Υπουργείο Εξωτερικών Foreign Office και συνομίλησαν με τον υπεύθυνο Ευρωπαϊκών Υποθέσεων και του Κυπριακού. Ο Δήμαρχος και οι Σύμβουλοι του είχαν ακόμα πολλές συναντήσεις με τα οργανωμένα σύνολα της Ομογένειας. Όλες τις ομιλίες στο House of Commons θα τις παρακολουθήσετε προσεχώς στην εκπομπή με το φακό του Hellenic TV.